We've got a couple of announcements. Number one, turn off your devices. And this Friday at 6.30 is uh, Tom Stammen is going to be here for IMI, but they're also going to have the uh, Eastern Gate House of Prayer. It's going to start at 6.30, and they'll just basically do that from 6.30 to 7.30, and then Tom will take over and begin his ministry at that point. Those of you that I think everybody's familiar with what goes on then, uh, he'll, he'll have a, generally it's about a half hour, 40 minutes or so of just preaching the word. Then there'll be a, it's about a eight to 10 minute uh, video of the current things that are going on in the ministry as far as their orphanages and their feeding programs and so forth and uh, various outreaches that they're involved in. And then after that, he'll have a one-on-one -on -one ministry where he'll prophesy and pray for people. And depending, obviously, on the numbers of people, how long that lasts. Now, if you're here and you want to participate in that one-on-one -on -one ministry, once he's ministered to you, you're free to leave. And in fact, you're free to leave anytime you want to. But if you want to stay for that part of the service, uh, you know, you don't have to stay until it's completely over with. Because generally, other people are downstairs and they're having some tea or soda or whatever and some cookies or what have you. And then uh, they'll come up as as they're called, and he'll just minister to them one on one. So, uh, if you can be here, that'll be great. Uh, as I've said before, it's it, it really is a great opportunity for this church, a church of this size, to be able to sow into a ministry that's really having an impact around the world in terms of orphans, widows, but mainly orphans and and kids that have been caught up in the sex trade and all sorts of things. Where you know. We forget sometimes in, in these third world countries how how pitiful it is. In fact, I was listening to a sh uh, the radio for a little while yesterday, and I told Sally, I said, it's insane. Neiman Marcus had uh, here just a short time back jeans that you could buy or Levi's, whatever they were. They were some kind of jeans that had pre-mud stains put on them. Uh, this is a God's honest truth. 400 and some dollars for a pair of pre-stained jeans. Then they had these ragged ones, you know, yeah. that are like 350 bucks or something for a pair of ragged jeans. I told Sally, I said, well, when I was a kid, if I'd have told my mom, I want you to buy me some ragged jeans, she just said, just go upstairs and get them out of your drawer. You know, <laughs> I mean, because that's what, you know, you wore them until they got ragged and then you used them for play and, and working and so on and so forth. Now they're paying 400 and some bucks. Now get this though, this is even more insane. They had these, they call them destroyed tennis shoes or sneakers. And they're old basketball, you remember the old basketball shoes that we used to have, the high tops, you know, just regular like Converse and those? That's what they are, only they're just shredded, basically. They just got, the soles are still on them and enough whole eyelets that you can lace them, but they're just all shredded out, you know, just worn out. Fort, honest to God, $1,400 a pair. How, what? What in the world? Why would anybody do that? I mean, it just it makes absolutely no sense. And there's people that don't have shoes. There's people that are going hungry. There are people that don't have clothes. And here we've got idiots that are out there spending $400 for a ragged pair of jeans and $1,400 for a pair of worn-out tennis shoes. I don't, I mean, I don't, I don't even know what to say about it. It's just, it's more than crazy. It's just the height of greed and selfishness and stupidity, I mean, I don't get it. I've got worn out stuff I'll be happy to sell to anybody that's interested, praise the Lord, and I'll give you a good deal on it. <laughs> Buy in bulk from me, praise the Lord. Anyway, so anyway, Tom's doing a lot of really good things uh, in, in various countries, uh, but the major thrust is in South America, and they do have farms down there now where they're actually self-sufficient and they're growing their own crops and raising their own livestock and all sorts of other things. So they're helping the communities as well as the individuals that are having all their problems. So if you can be here, that's a great thing. Again, it's a way for us as a small church to be able to sow into something that's really making a difference. And that's what I appreciate ab about it more than anything else. So praise the Lord. Okay. And then we're going to have a church picnic June 10th or the 17th, depending on what the weather is. We're, we're planning on having it the 10th. If it rains, then we'll have it on the 17th. We're going to have it at our house, uh, and we'll, all the I information on how to get there and everything will be given to you. It's just out in the country between Mitchellville and Colfax. 
kind of country, but there's other houses out there too, so it's a, it's a development out in the middle of nowhere, basically. But uh, we want to try to, you know, just have an opportunity for everybody to get together and something outside of just in a church service. And uh, <coughs> what, what do you say, Sally? 11 o'clock or something like that's when it will start, I suppose. And, and go tell people get worn out or tired of being around us and want to leave. <laughs> yeah, which could be early. It might be an early e evening, you know, I don't know. It's been... But um, as far as we're concerned, you can come and stay as long as you want to stay. And yeah, that's yeah, right. Anyway, we'll uh, and they'll, we'll give you more details as we go along as far as what we need to do. But it's just an opportunity for all of us to get together outside of a church service and and just kind of we'll have some games. I think uh, croquet and badminton or. Uh, corn toss, like, you know, uh, horseshoes without uh, pain. That's what I call them, praise the Lord. Uh, anyway, just some stuff like that and, and some food and just a chance to hang out and have some fun together. Praise the Lord. Okay, that's so much for the announcements. Um, again, the 10th of June, and then if we have bad weather that weekend, we'll have it the following weekend on the 17th, so. Yeah, we're just set fire to the shed dormer and <laughs> yeah, or cars next door, whatever, whatever we need to do. Anyway, well, I'm sure we'll get one decent weekend out of those two, so we'll we'll do something. Anyway, praise the Lord, everybody. Thank you for that, and uh, that's uh, I guess that's it for the announcements, right? All right, praise the Lord. Any prayer requests this evening? That that looks good. Yes. Amen. Praise the Lord, Eric. We're grateful to have you here. And uh, you know God's able. And we're just going to agree with you that God's going to provide the job that's uh, not just a uh, income but something that can satisfy the you know your your work ethic and so on and so forth and give you some satisfaction not just a paycheck and and that god we know he's going to bless you he has and he, he will continue to do that he's faithful praise the lord and he understands us <laughs> that's right well I'm, I'm all for it praise the lord Praise the Lord. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Yeah. It's never fun. It's never fun. I mean, it's one thing to lose a job through attrition or layoffs and what have you, but. I know what you're saying, Eric. Too, when you get when the, when it's a firing c scenario, it, there's always, you know, uncomfortable feelings about that. And like you said, shame. There's guilt. But you got nothing to be ashamed of or 
guilty for. There is no condemnation in God. God sees you as perfect. Amen. Nothing has changed as far as God's concerned, and certainly nothing has changed as far as we're concerned. But God's got something even better for you. If, if what the devil meant for evil, even when we cooperate, God still means to use it for good, and that's, that's the bottom line. Amen. That God's going to turn this thing around and make a positive out of what the enemy's trying to make a negative out of. Praise the Lord. We're just going to stay in faith for that. Amen. Okay. Praise God. Anybody else? Yes, Tim. We do need to pray. This is uh, <coughs> serious everywhere. I mean, uh, I don't know that any of us have a handle on it or, you know, why other than just young people do stupid things. And this is a extremely stupid and, and everybody's a loser. The shooter, the shot, the families, the community, everybody suffers as a result of it. And that's not a God thing. We know that. So God wants there to be safety and security in our communities, wants our young people to be able to grow up feeling safe and not have to hide in the basement or, you know, every time a car goes by, duck for, for fear that somebody's going to be just shooting for the sake of shooting or whatever. Or just be an innocent bystander that happens to be somewhere and somebody just starts shooting and they get hit. So um, everybody, everybody's at risk. As I said, it's not just the people that are being uh, shot but their families, extended family, all of this, it plays into everything and the community. And then think about the person doing it. For a moment, just for one moment, a stupid decision and their life is totally changed forever. And the lives of everybody that's connected with them is forever gonna be upside down and backwards. And that's just, that's just the devil, that's all it is. It's the enemy coming to seek, to steal, to kill and to destroy. And that's what this is all about. But God is greater, and we need to pray for our communities. We need to pray for our young people, amen, that, that God can, can uh, have an opportunity to deal with them. But we know God can change these situations in these cities. We just have to pray and believe. And that's one of the things about Eastgate House of Prayer. That's part of what that's about is to, to bring a, a covering and, and a protection. And uh, I told Mike, you know, it isn't how many people show up for that because this isn't just about the people that are here. It's releasing prophetic words and agreement with God into the, into the uh, atmosphere, into this city, and that's important. So uh, just because you don't see immediate results doesn't mean things aren't happening, because they're happening in the spirit before they ever happen here. So we're definitely going to agree with uh, Tim and Lee on this and pray, amen, for God's intervention and for the protection of our young people in our communities as well. Yes.
Calvin. God knows. God knows. Praise the Lord. Anybody else? Okay. Um, now, the Lord knows all of these needs. He knew them before we asked. He just asks us to, to speak them so that when he moves, God gets the glory. Amen. So let's just take this to the Lord. And I just want you to confess what it is you're asking for. Amen. We're not begging God to do something. God already wants to do this. He wanted to do it before he laid it on your heart to pray about it. Amen. So we're going to just confess and celebrate the victory, amen, for jobs, for uh, safety in the communities, for, for the violence and so forth, for uh, personal issues with Alvin, uh, the, the cancers, the attacks of the enemy against people's health. All of these things we know God's will about, amen. We know that God wants them to be healed or he wouldn't suffer for their healing. He wants relationships whole and restored. Amen. Jesus suffered the division from his own people and, and, and rejection from his own people so that we could have wholeness and, and oneness in our relationships. And uh, the violence, we know where that comes from. It's coming from the enemy. Jesus has defeated him. We have to stand on that and declare the victory. Amen. From victory. Amen. That God has given us. So let's just do that right now. Father, in the name of Jesus, we just take authority in the name of Jesus over every one of these situations, over every circumstance and every individual. Lord, we know that you are greater than all of our issues, all of our problems, all of our fears, all of our doubts. Lord, you've come to give us wholeness and victory, Lord, in every area. And we just come against the violence in our communities right now. We rebuke the enemy wherever he has come, amen, to try to bring death, early death and destruction and damage to families. Lord, we rebuke that right now and we release the love of God and the power of God into these communities where individuals and, and groups will rise up, hallelujah, and reach out in these communities and release the love of God and share God in these areas, Lord. Throughout our cities, throughout our, our small towns, Lord, it's happening everywhere, Lord. But you are greater than any attack of the enemy. And Lord, we know that you've caused us to prosper and you want us to prosper so that your covenant can be fulfilled in this earth. So we pray for jobs right now, not only for a job, but the job, the job, Lord, that you have uh, perfectly provided in mind for each individual here who's looking for either a job or another job. And Lord, we just believe right now that as we pray, you're setting things up for these realities to come to pass. Hallelujah. You'll make connections with other people that will cause the, the ideal job situation to be fulfilled. And we believe that right now in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, that, that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. And we stand on that promise this evening right now, Lord. We put our confidence in you and you alone, Lord. You are our Savior, our Deliverer, our Provider, our Healer, our Lord and our God. And to you be all the glory in Jesus' mighty name. And everybody said, praise the Lord. <laughs> Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah. We look forward to testimonies, amen, of what God's doing in each one of these situations. Praise the Lord. Ron, as always, you the man. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Ron is a good man, a faithful, faithful guy. Praise the Lord. We appreciate him. His love for God. Ron, if you would, just go ahead and pray for this offering tonight. Father, we thank you, Lord, for this day you've given us. This day in Jesus Christ, that now we need to enjoy. Amen. Even though things might not always be what we like to get do, but you have had all things in control, and you will provide for us. You will establish your kingdom.
Amen. Amen. God bless y'all. We're going to go into worship now. Hallelujah.
Praise God. Praise God. The joy of the Lord is our strength. Hallelujah. Praise God. We rejoice in the Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. We rejoice for what you're doing right now in the lives of your people, Lord. Hallelujah, Lord. Praise God. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Praise God. Praise God. Amen. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. Praise the Lord. Think about the blood that flowed from Emmanuel's veins. Praise the Lord. You know, he said it was by blood and water. And he tells us, we know that we were cleansed and uh, our sins forgiven because of the shed blood of Jesus. And then he told us that it's by the washing of the water of the word, praise the Lord, that continues, amen, the renewal of us and our minds in Christ, praise the Lord. It's a finished work, and yet our minds need to continually be renewed to the reality of our true identity and who we are in Christ, what God has done for us, amen, because the enemy's job, he can't take away your salvation. All he can do is confuse you and make you feel like you're unsaved, praise the Lord, and make you feel like you don't deserve the blessings of God, but Jesus has qualified you qualified each and every one of us from now through eternity for all of the goodness and the grace and the favor of God Almighty. Hallelujah. We just have to stand on that and confess it and receive it in his precious name. Amen. Amen. All right. Praise the Lord. God bless all of you again for being here tonight. We'll get right to the word so I don't keep you too late. And I want to begin tonight in Ephesians chapter 2 and we'll read verses 1 through 9. Ephesians chapter 2. Verse 1 through 9, praise the Lord. Amen. God is good all the time. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. God has got some powerful things that he's going to do in people's lives this year. Amen. And and I just really believe that the more we uh, tap into his reality the more we're going to see the manifestations that God wants for all of us. Some of us have been waiting years for some of the things that God's going to do this year. Amen. Amen. And I really believe that. And this is not, this isn't like the ultimate thing. It's it's just, this is an opening that God is, is creating. Amen. So that he can take us to the next step and to the next step and to the next step. So this isn't the end of anything. It isn't the Uh, even totally the fulfillment of all things, but it's certainly the fulfillment of some promises God has made to different ones of us over the years, and we're going to see some of those things manifest in ways that we haven't in the past, but I think it's going to build our faith for even greater things that God wants to do for the rest of our lives, amen, for the lives of the people that we have, uh, uh, that we interact with, and uh, the way God wants to minister, amen, to us, and then, of course, through us, praise the Lord. So, Ephesians chapter 2, beginning at verse uh, 1. And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the promise of the power of the air, or excuse me, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past, in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love, wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sin, hath quickened us together with Christ, by grace you are saved, and hath raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So when you look at these scriptures, and it's fairly easy to learn how you were saved. But what's weird about it is you can, without too much difficulty, you can learn how you were saved and never really understand why you were saved. Praise the Lord. The how is simple, God's grace. Praise the Lord. But we need to understand the why. The next verse, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. For 
we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Now, he said everything that he said to bring us to this point. We are, because of all that, for we, the result of that is, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Amen? Now, that word workmanship means really to be made with a purpose or for a purpose. This is our purpose. We are saved by grace to share grace. Praise the Lord. Another translation for that workmanship is masterpiece. And, you know, if you know anything about art, masterpiece, when you have a masterpiece, it's, it's pointing to something more than just a picture. I mean, there's like a, an essence that the artist is trying to, I don't want to get too artsy on you here, but that he's trying to, present an emotion, you know, a feeling, a, a reality that's greater than can be captured on a canvas or in a song or in a poem, but it somehow touches the, the inner part of us, the, the heart of us, if you will, the spirit of us that draws us out. And so he has created us a masterpiece so that he can bring out the essence of his reality, a, a greater truth, uh, something that can't be captured just in a human flesh. But there's a purity and a reality of God in each one of us that he wants to be revealed, that he wants to reveal so that other people can see this workmanship. He gives us grace so that we can give grace. Praise the Lord. The good works are just basically opportunities to dispense grace. He's not talking about working to get saved because we already know we're saved already. This isn't about doing work, amen, to somehow get God's favor. But the work that he's talking about is really opportunities to dispense grace, to release grace to others as we have received it. In other words, we are grace dispensers. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Get some grace, hallelujah. We are grace dispensers, or at least we're intended to be. Now, the people who interact with you, are they more likely to experience guilt or grace? Let me just think about that for a minute. I don't want to show of hands. But think about, you know, your interactions. Now, when you walk away from an interaction with a, some individual, any individual, do you think they feel guilty or have they felt grace have they felt acceptance have they felt loved have they felt a commitment a, a care or have they felt shame or humiliated or embarrassed because God never does that to anybody I know many times Tim from this pulpit has talked about and all of us have experienced it probably to some degree if not personally we've seen it in other people's lives where, where a child is taught over and over, you're worthless, you're nothing, you're nobody, you're a bum, you're lazy, you're, you know, you're this, you're stupid, you're all these things. And then wonder why they grow up to be lazy, stupid, shiftless, worthless. Right? What we sow into people determines what's going to bear fruit later on. Amen? And so God never talks to us that way. He never... He never speaks to us in a way that demeans us or, or humiliates us or embarrasses us. He's the perfect father. Amen? So this workmanship that we have, it should attract. But here's the thing. It attracts hurting people. It'll attract broken people because it provides a refuge that they won't find anyplace else. The world can't offer refuge. It's what we talked about earlier tonight. That the violence, and it's everywhere, guys. Just uh, out in the middle of, even outside the suburbs in the country, just a, a mile or so from Tamar, 
guy shoots his mother and his father and his sister. 21-year-old guy. It happens everywhere. It's insanity. It's demonic. But when people feel defeated and empty, they do crazy stuff. And also when people are defeated and empty, do they find a second chance or a third chance or a fourth chance or an ad infinitum, hallelujah, because we all need chances over and over and over. As long as we're on this planet, we're going to need more chances because we're going to fail. Yeah, that's just the reality of it. But God doesn't say, hey, this is your fourth shot at this, man. He just acts like it's the first time. He loves us. He cares for us. And he expects us to do the same thing. We are his workmanship, created for good works, for his works. Amen? Amen. People need a fresh start. They need lots of fresh starts. And we need to be willing to give it to them. When you take grace out of the church, you need to call the church something other than the church. Praise the Lord. When you take forgiveness and mercy and love and grace, when you take that out of the church, it, it, it's not a church. It's something else. Praise the Lord. Because where there's no grace, there is no church. We've just seen it. Praise the Lord. Grace is reckless. Praise the Lord. A priest named Manning calls it... Uh, can't even remember now. Crazy grace, you know, insane grace. Uh, I can't remember now exactly his words for it. But here's a guy who was an alcoholic, a priest, who had had been married. Then marriage went kind of south, and then he eventually becomes a priest. He's an alcoholic. Just had all kinds of issues. And he wrote, I think, two or three books. If you ever get a chance to read one of them, it'd be great. It'd be good for you. I'm not endorsing Catholicism, but I'm saying God is God to him the same as he's God to us. He, he may not have the same doctrinal understanding or, or that, but God's love is the same. And he experienced the grace of God over and over and over, and he shares it in ways I think that would touch anybody's life. You may not be an alcoholic. You may not have that issue, but whatever your issue is, it's no different. You know, just pick and choose one because we all got them. But that's, that happened to be his thing. But how God loved him through all of that and loved him in spite of all of that. And all of us got stuff that God has to love us through and love us past them in spite of them. Amen? So grace is reckless. But even more important, grace is required. Everybody has to have grace. Everybody needs grace. Praise the Lord. All right, look at Mark chapter 10 and verse 45. See, you know, and I'm not taking away the fact that there's responsibility. Uh, whoever kills another person, shoots another person, God's grace is sufficient for forgiveness for that individual, the one who pulled the trigger. There's still consequences. He may go to jail for the rest of his life, her life, whatever, but God's forgiveness is still available. And that's what I'm saying. We, we have a tendency to, you know, our compassion obviously goes out to the victims as it should, but the guy that pulled the trigger or the woman that pulled the trigger is as much a victim as the person that they shot. As hard as that is for us to understand, something terribly broken in them makes it possible for them to commit that act. Something, something very, very fundamental in who we are as God's creation has just gone completely sideways. And the enemy has gotten an opportunity to manipulate and destroy and express his reality instead of God's. It's our responsibility to show the love of God, the grace of God in every situation, not just in the ones that seem easy to do. It's not hard to have compassion and share our, our, our love for somebody who's going through a really tough time. But what about the person who brings on themselves they need the love of God as much as the person who's the victim in these situations. So even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. When Jesus said this to his disciples, this is what's interesting to me. He was at least three years into his ministry. 
his earthly ministry was almost over, in fact. So it's interesting that he shares his purpose with them again after all this time that he'd been with them. You'd think that uh, at this point, they'd understand who he was and what he was about, what he was doing, what his purpose was, what his mission was, amen? They'd heard the Sermon on the Mount. They heard it in person. They were there, heard it from his own lips, amen? They'd seen the miracles firsthand. They'd heard him pray and interact with the Spirit. Yet only a short time before Jesus is going to enter Jerusalem for the last time, they needed a reminder of his purpose. Even though Jesus had told them otherwise, the disciples expected Jesus to establish a physical kingdom. And we know that because all you got to do is see what happened at the crucifixion. They went crazy. They went in every direction because they thought he was going to overthrow Rome. He, they thought he was just going to somehow do this by the power of God, just the same way as he raised the dead and cast out demons, he was going to cast Rome out of there, and they were going to have a physical kingdom of God right there. And in fact, uh, the, the unsaved, uh, if you will, Jews today still think the same thing. They're still waiting for their Messiah to come and establish his kingdom on earth. Praise the Lord. So that's, that's where their heads were, and... Uh, they were, they were looking for this thing, a physical kingdom. And that's, that's the same reason why they jockeyed for position as to who would be the greatest. They weren't talking about heaven. They were talking about who's going to be the uh, prime minister. You know, you're king, but who's going to be the prime minister? Who's going to be this guy? Who's going to have this job? Who's going to be on the right hand? Who's going to be on the left? Who's going to have the next position of power? Who's going to have the next highest point uh, or place of respect? Amen. Look at Mark chapter 10. And uh, verse 35, now we read this, and, and James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came unto him, saying, Master, we would that thou show, shouldest do for us whatsoever we shall desire. Oh, God, that sounds like a prayer of mine. <laughs> oh, God, I want you to do whatever I ask. Amen? But look at verse 37. They said unto him, Grant unto us that we may sit on one, one on the right hand side, or one on the right hand, and the other on the left hand, in thy glory. Now, generally we read that and we think, oh, they're talking about in heaven. That's not the glory, that word glory translates in your dignity, in your, in your place of, uh, as a dignitary. In other words, when you get your earthly kingdom established here, your, your glory, amen, we want one on the right and one on the left, amen this position of dignity. And Jesus responds in verse 38. Jesus said unto them, you don't know what you're asking. You want on the right hand and the left? You're going to have to take the place of these two thieves. When I reach the position that I'm vying for here on this planet, I'm going to be hanging from a cross. That's what he said. You guys don't get it. You, you don't understand what you're asking for. Can you drink the cup that I'm going to drink and be baptized with the baptism that I'm going to be baptized with? Now, when, here's what's odd, too. When the other ten disciples find out about it, this conversation that, uh, that they had, they all were mad now at, at James and John, right? Either they were mad at, the, at James and John's arrogance for even asking the question, or they were mad because they didn't get to Jesus first with their request. Praise the Lord. Like, you, you backstabbers, you know, we had a plan too. You know, we just didn't think you'd spring it on him this quick. So, so Jesus sets everything straight. Look at Mark now, chapter 10, verse 43 through 45. Mark 10, verse 43 through 45. But so shall it not be among you. But whosoever will be great among you shall be your minister. Whosoever of you will be the chiefest shall be the servant of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. Praise the Lord. So that's pretty easy to articulate, but it's pretty tough to live a life like that. Amen. Look at it. It's not going to be that way with you guys. But whoever wants to be great among you, 
is going to have to serve you. Whoever of you is, wants to be the big dog, top dog, chiefest, is going to be servant of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life for many. Ransom, praise the Lord. All right, look at Matthew now, chapter 20 and verse 16. Matthew 20, verse 16. So the last shall be first, and the first shall be last. For many be called, but few chosen. Uh, my grandson, who has uh, just turned five in preschool, and he got in trouble the other day, my daughter was telling us, for shoving. Because we call him Bubba. Uh, not because he's a redneck, because he's a redhead, praise the Lord. It's just Bubba. It's just call him Bubba because they, you know, brother Bubba, so, you know. But uh, anyway, he got in some trouble for shoving. And how many of you remember when you were a kid? Did anybody play King on the Mountain? Yeah. You know, King of the Mountain? Just get a little hill somewhere, anything, just, and last one standing wins. You know, you just keep trying to shove everybody off, keep. Keep them out of there. So that was Bubba without a mountain. <laughs> he's, just, he's just shoving. Praise the Lord. But Jesus, see, he made himself nothing. He made himself nothing. And then he turns to us and he says, follow me. Praise the Lord. Follow me to seeming obscurity. Follow me to selflessness. Follow me to uh, an others focused life. Follow me into my kingdom. Now if this is the blueprint for workmanship How's it working out in us? Praise the Lord. Philippians 2, uh, verses 5 through 13. See, when we think of obscurity or insignificance, we think of failure. Well, that's not what Jesus says. Now you can ask me, Nathan, wouldn't you wouldn't you like to have wouldn't you like to pastor a church of five hundred or a thousand or ten thousand or something? I yes. From a human perspective, I would. I mean I'd I'd have to be stupid to not. And yet I'm doing what Jesus told me to do, and if there's 30 people or 20 people or 10 people, even though it looks obscure and like failure to some, Jesus said, this is, this is what I've called you to. Praise the Lord. You can say, well, that's a cop-out. Well, call it what you like, but I'm, I'm giving you scripture. Now, my ego says something else, obviously, but this isn't about my ego. Amen. Otherwise, I'd be saying, <clears throat> excuse me, John, excuse me, James, I, I need to have a word with the Lord here for a minute. <laughs> if I can't be on the right hand or the left hand, could I be, you know, just to the left of the one that's on the left? <laughs> or just to the right of the one that's on the right? You know what I mean? Yeah. Amen. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. Being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Wherefore, my beloved... As ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation 
with fear and trembling, for it is God who, which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Praise the Lord. So serving instead of being served sounds real poetic. I mean, kind of gives you the, you know, religious kind of, oh, that's really nice. But it can end up being really painful. Just ask Jesus. Consider his life, his death. Amen. He came from heaven to earth to serve people. And the very people that he came to serve put him on the cross. Or at best, they just reject him and deny him. Right? I'm not saying you're going to be crucified. But don't be surprised if you get persecuted. Don't be surprised if stuff happens in your life. Praise the Lord. John 15 Verses 1 through 8. Now, I'm going to tell you this. If you do this, God will exalt you. Amen? There's a, there, Jesus is the prototype in, in terms of this particular story. He humbled himself. Thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Well, we are the sons of God. We are created in his image after his likeness. And yet we have to humble ourselves in order to complete the work that God has given us. The workmanship, this, this what he designed us for, amen, is God-like. But it has to be humbled to operate in this earth with other humans. Praise the Lord. So that we serve rather than trying to dominate or control. I am the true vine, my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it that it may bring forth more fruit. Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself. Except it abide in the vine, no more can you except ye abide in me. I am in the vine, you are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered, and, a man can, uh, and a men gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you'll ask what you will, and it'll be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified, that you bear much fruit, so shall you be my disciples. Remain with me, right? Be with me. Yeah, there's a world to save. There's no question about it. There, there's stuff that needs to be done, amen? There's issues all around us that we know of. There's workmanship to be worked. But first... And always remain connected. Praise the Lord. Because outside of him, you're not going to accomplish anything. You're not going to get anything done. What Jesus wanted the most was not more from his followers, but more of his followers. He wasn't asking for us to do more. He was asking for us to give more to him, to be more connected with him. Now, don't, don't misunderstand what I'm saying here. Look at Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. One to do for Jesus is admirable. I'm not saying that's bad. I'm not saying that's wrong. But doing doesn't lead to being. And that's what Jesus is talking about. Abide in me. Stay connected to me. If you do that, then this, this sense of uh, measuring success or failure isn't part of the equation anymore. As a pastor of a church or as just a human being trying to live their life and not being perfectly successful in every area. Praise the Lord. We've got to stick to him. We've got to abide in him. That's our victory. That's, that's where we're going to succeed. And that keeps us tuned in to grace so that when we see people struggling around us, we can say, man, you may not think I can relate, but believe me, I relate. It took just as much grace for me as it takes for you. You may feel like you're wearing out grace. Believe me, you're not gonna, it's not going to happen. Hallelujah. His grace is sufficient. 
Praise God. Real compassion. Reckless grace. And, and all the other qualities of what it is to be like Jesus. They only flow from our relationship with Jesus. They don't come from striving to, to do more for him or to be more perfect. As much as we want to do right things, those realities, that grace, that ministry, if you will, the anointing flows out of our connection with Jesus, out of our abiding in him. That's why grace is so important because the enemy's job is to get you to not abide. How many of you ever saw the big Lowski? The dude abides. That's my, that's my motto. That's my life words. The dude abides, praise the Lord. That's the key. I know I'm being facetious, but we have to abide because it's being, it's, it's, it's being connected to him that keeps the enemy having the inroads of telling us, you louse, you bum, you low down, no good, whatever. No, I, if I'm abiding, I'm victorious. That's the kind of the story. This guy's a bowler. It's a long, complicated, stupid movie. But in the end, after all the horrors and nightmares and everything he's been through, the guy says, how you doing? And he says, the dude abides. That ought to be, I, that may be on my tombstone. <laughs> Praise the Lord. We abide in him. And if we abide in him, we are victorious. We are successful. Because fruit will be produced if we abide. We're not producing it. We're just bearing it. We just stay connected, and the fruit is an automatic result of our connection with him, of our abiding in him. Amen? All right, back to Ephesians, and we'll wrap this up. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past he walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ, by grace you are saved, and hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourself. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. So our focus isn't to know more about Jesus. Our focus is learning to know Jesus. Praise the Lord. And the only way for that to happen is by grace. Grace, he says, come boldly to the throne of grace. Grace makes it possible, even with all of our flaws, with all of our failures, on a day-to-day, moment-to-moment basis, to come boldly to God and know that we are accepted in the beloved, that he loves us so that we can abide in him and have the victory that he has promised us, his workmanship, that he'll work out through us. Amen? Amen. Give the Lord a hand clap tonight. Praise God. <laughs> amen, amen. God bless you all. Abide. You're a winner, hallelujah. You're dismissed in Jesus' name.